BBOR Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia at heart and from around the globe. And today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. How's everybody doing? Hope everyone had a good weekend. Welcome to the show. In this episode, I will be discussing the recent Zodiac Killer debate that was on Planet X Filmworks, featuring Thomas Henry Hoare and Andrew Zer. I will be responding to the documentary Deciphering the Zodiac Killer, which has been made available on Jason Hassett's channel, and I will be accepting a Zodiac challenge from Mike Rodelli. But first, a quick word from the sponsor of today's episode, and this is coming to us from Stuart McAdam. You may have seen on the channel the other day that I spoke to Stuart McAdam. His business, PaidAdvertisingHelp.com, is sponsoring today's Zodiac Monday. Paid Advertising Help provides advertising services to service and e-commerce businesses. Their areas of expertise are in creating sustainable and profitable long-term campaigns on Google, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Stuart and his team have personally spent over $7.5 million across all paid advertising platforms and don't mess around when it comes to getting results. With the ever-evolving platforms, tools, and features on different advertising platforms, and having the right support for your business is crucial. So if you run a business and would like to get a free quote for Google, Facebook, or YouTube advertising help, visit paidadvertisinghelp.com. There's a link below in the description box as well as pinned with the quick reference. And thank you so much to Stuart for that. And yes, Stuart was in an episode on this channel because he's a close follower of not only the Zodiac Killer Mystery, but also the D.B. Cooper case. And a lot of people have been responding to some recent episodes about that because I also talked to Ross Rossi from Planet X Filmworks about the Zodiac Killer and D.B. Cooper. There are two different interviews that I've done, and the comments that have been coming in are saying, well, there's no possible way that the Zodiac Killer and D.B. Cooper were the same person. And to be fair to Stuart and Ross, neither one of them said that the Zodiac Killer and D.B. Cooper were the same person. There are theorists out there. However, Neither one of these guys supports that theory. In the interview, first we talked about the Zodiac Killer, and then about halfway through we switched over to D.B. Cooper. And I invite you guys to check out some content here on this channel. You can also hit the like button and subscribe. It really helps out Black Box Online Radio. And you can go through some of the links in the description box, of course, for Stewart's website, paidadvertisinghelp.com. But you can also find one for buymeacoffee.com. Buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnid88 allows you to make a donation or a contribution to help support the show. And anybody who makes a donation will get a shout-out here on Zodiac Monday. And I also want to give a big shout-out to Ray Grant, who is going to be a guest on the program this week. And Ray Grant has released a series of videos on his YouTube channel talking about the Zodiac Killer crime scenes and doing walkthroughs on how each crime could have taken place, as well as the actions of the victims prior to their murders. He begins with the 1966 murder of Sherry Jo Bates, and then he goes into Lake Herman Road and Blue Rock Springs. Those have been released at the time of this recording. I particularly liked his episode on Lake Herman Road, but the Blue Rock Springs uh, episode had some very good theorizing in it as well. One more time, you can hear that on Ray Grant's channel, and also giving a shout-out to Jerome, who runs the French Wrecking Crew. He has uploaded a documentary about the Zodiac Killer called Zodiac All the Facts, and it has French subtitles because Jerome is from Belgium, so if anybody is from the French-speaking world and you want to follow along that way, that might also be of interest to you. And I really have to thank Jerome because he says a lot of good things about the book Killer on a White Horse, A Story of the Evening Watchman. That is the novel written by me, Ned Dahan, and Dr Jerome was encouraging people to get the paperback version, which is on Amazon.com, but me as the writer, I'm just inviting people to listen to the audiobook version now. You can just listen for free. Segments of Killer on a White Horse are going to be coming out every weekend on this channel. I just released part five this most previous weekend, and you can listen to the audiobook version 100% for free here on YouTube. But I want to respond to the debate that was on Ross Jirasi's channel, Planet X Filmworks, featuring Thomas Henry Horan and Druzer. Thomas Horan is the chief architect and proponent of the Zodiac hoax theory and author of the book The Myth of the Zodiac Killer. And Druzer doesn't have an exact suspect. He is someone who is looking at the facts. He has a lot of observations about the case, but he was definitely an underdog. I think that was fair to say. So, of course, I always have to root for the underdogs, but I knew that Druzer had some powerful punches that he could have used when he wants to criticize the hoax theory. I've discussed it with him before, and he has some very critical observations. 
believe it or not, I actually thought this debate was a little bit less energetic and less um, hot-headed than I expected. I was more or less expecting a giant shouting match between the two of them, but everything was mostly um, mild in that regard. Now, it definitely went off in some different directions, and I mean this in absolutely no disrespect to Ross or Thomas or Druzer, but the first 35 minutes were very messy. And Ross, as a moderator, if you haven't heard this, you can still just keep listening. Ross, as the moderator, was really trying to direct the conversation back toward the Zodiac crime scenes and go through one by one. Because the Zodiac killer committed the Lake Herman Road murders on December 20th of 1968, the Blue Rock Springs shooting on July 4th of 1969, the Lake Burias stabbing on September 27th of 1969, and the murder of Paul Stein on October. October 11th of that year, and Ross wanted to go through them one by one, but, I mean, when you're having a multi-guest discussion, I'm sure that's going to happen at some points where things go off in different directions. But I've read the book The Myth of the Zodiac Killer by Thomas Henry Hoare, and I did a book discussion on that back in 2020, and somebody saw my copy of that sitting around once. It was a family member, actually, over Christmas one year, and they said, what is this Myth of the Zodiac Killer? I mean, because they know I read Zodiac Killer books, they see them around all the time, but what is the Myth of the Zodiac Killer? And my best attempt at trying to introduce it was that it's the theory that the crimes that have been attributed to the Zodiac Killer, which I have just listed off, were not committed by one single person. Instead, they were committed by a group of individuals, an unconnected group, mind you. These are the multiple killers without a organized group. It's just an unconnected group of individuals, and somebody wrote letters taking credit for the crimes that he did not commit himself. And then this goes into the creation of the Zodiac Killer persona. When Thomas Henry Horne released the book The Myth of the Zodiac Killer, I thought that he really focused on the angle involving vigilante journalism. The first section of the book talks about how Robert Graysmith, who wrote the most famous Zodiac book, Zodiac, in 1986, was a liar. He provided falsehoods in his book. He said things that were not true, and he provides an explanation as to how and why these falsehoods were arranged. And he goes through it page by page, more or less, debunking Robert Graysmith. It's called The Great Zodiac Killer Hoax of 1986. The middle section talks about how vigilante journalism created the Zodiac Killer, and then the third section gets more into about how he's trying to move this toward a suspect named Harold K. Snook, commonly known as Hal Snook. But with the middle section, I mean, Thomas Horan talked about this so much in the past, about how the San Francisco Chronicle was one place where the Zodiac Killer was sending in letters, and the Chronicle was very famous for being a tabloid publication. They made up stories all the time, and he told one story once about how there was this there was this riot that took place it was caused by biker gangs and it was all fake it was all made up it, they took photos of motorcycles on top of broken glass bottles and even the chief photographer is featured in it where he just set the whole thing up and someone told him to, he told someone to pull the trigger for the uh, camera camera trigger at a certain time the whole thing was fake they made up this massive fake story and just the zodiac killer is an ex another example of that. They made up the story of a serial killer that was unidentifiable because it's a murder mystery that can't be solved. Okay, you guys have heard me talk a lot about that in the past. That's more or less an introduction to the Zodiac hoax theory, and I'm not going to go through too many things other than saying that at a certain point, Thomas Henry Horn seemed to have somewhat of a reversal and maybe a switch in his gears when he started talking about how the origin of the Zodiac hoax theory was not the Chronicle or any newspaper. We also have the San Francisco Examiner and the Vallejo Times Herald, but they are not the origin of this. This is actually something that is connected to drug smuggling, the CIA, and some type of spy network. And this is the stuff that I heard in the debate that I've never responded to before here on Black Box Online Radio, and that is that Thomas Horne has looked at a lot of the families in Zodiac victim, a lot of the families of Zodiac victims, as well as some of the unconfirmed cases, and looking at how so many of them have connections to the military and specifically to military systems. For example, Sherry Jo Bates, a victim who is unconfirmed, had a father who worked with the Corona, the military installation in Riverside near Corona, California. Leo Sowenin, the brother of Darlene Farron, who was murdered on July 4th of 1969, 
Leo Sawinen had a machinist job where he worked with submarines at Mare Island, that's the naval base, and he goes through this showing about how there are numerous examples of how the families of the victims have connections to the military and to military systems, even stating that the father of Betty Lou Jensen, the victim at Lake Herman Road, worked with chemical weapons. By chemical weapons, he specifically said something similar to napalm. I believe it was napalm or, uh, or similar substances. But not once in the entire debate did I hear anybody just say, okay, well, here's an alternative explanation to that. Here is perhaps just a simple way that we could unite all of this. The killer was in the military. Why are all these crimes happening to e either people who have relatives in the military, relatives who work on military bases, or that they're happening near military installations? The killer was in the military, and he was at the military base, and he's committing crimes in the vicinity of military bases, and that's why. Now, personally, I don't believe that Sherry Jo Bates was a victim of the Zodiac Killer. Even if she was, that explanation would still stand. And sooner or later, we're also going to have to accept the fact that there are numerous military bases in California, and there are going to be crimes that happen nearby. For example, in 1965, we have the murder of Diane Jarish. She is the victim in the Black Sapphire murder. I don't know who committed that crime, but I definitely believe that it was someone in the military based on how close her body was found to the Presidio military installation. I absolutely don't think it was the Zodiac. She was strangled with her own bra and sexually assaulted with a tree branch outside of the Zodiac's wheelhouse. But even more so than that, what about the Domingos Edwards murders in 1963, a crime that is very, very highly debated about whether or not that was the Zodiac killer? The ammunition from that crime could very well have come from a military base, from Vandenberg Air Force Base, and they tracked this down using the lot number. This is even featured on the TV show The Hunt for the Zodiac Killer with Ken Maines. So, there are all of these things that point toward the Zodiac Killer having some type of military background, and it's just very simple that you have these military bases that aren't in the middle of nowhere. They are within the continental United States, and that there are towns that are around them, and people who work in the town also can work at the military base. People who live in the town can work in the military base, is what I meant to say, and that's really all it is. It's not some type of overwhelming, deep, dark conspiracy involving spy networks. It's just the geographic layout of California. Now, in one of the tensest moments in the debate, I noticed that Thomas Henry Horn stated something that he shared in previous discussions, and that is that everything people have learned about the Zodiac Killer comes from Robert Graysmith's book. Every movie and documentary and podcast that they've seen, heard, or listened to comes from Robert Graysmith's book, that that's the source material. And Druser made the statement that, do you know how offensive it is to say that everything people have learned about the case comes from Graysmith's book? And even Ross, the narrator, us, a narrator, moderator, jumped in by saying that, okay, of course, not everything comes from Graysmith's book, but what Thomas Horne is trying to do is to show that Graysmith's book was very influential. I've responded to this a million times, but just to be very clear, I've never read Robert Graysmith's book from 1986, and the reason why is not only because of this lousy reputation that it has, it's because we have so many of the primary source documents available on the internet. You can go on Google Images and look at copies of the letters. You can get Tom Voigt's Zodiac Killer Just the Facts that has the typed version of the police reports, or you can go online and read them yourself. You can get all types of primary source documentation and examine it for yourself without Robert Graysmith. Now, to be clear, I did read Zodiac Killer, uh, Zodiac Unmasked by Graysmith, and I did a discussion on that one, but I've never read the 1986 book, so I also took some exception to the concept of every podcast is based on Graysmith's narrative, when it is widely accepted that Robert Graysmith did provide false statements in his book. And what Thomas Horan does is he tells a story in his own way that is rather half true and half false, and that is that 
What happened was, the majority of the Zodiac Killer case file was made available to the general public, and that it was obtained by Mike Rodelli, who then gave it to Michael Butterfield, who then gave it to Tom Voigt, and then put it, Tom Voigt put it on the internet. Now, that is not completely true, because Mike Rodelli said very clearly, he only obtained the police reports for Lake Herman Road. He didn't obtain the entire Zodiac Killer case file. Secondarily, Thomas Horan also states that Mike Rodelli spent thousands of dollars trying to obtain these files. I've talked to Mike Rodelli directly about this. He's been a guest on this channel, and he has said that that did not happen either, that he did not pay any money for these for the police files. They were given to him, they were provided to him, so I don't know the origin of that exact claim. But in the debate they also had some very st strong discussions that Mike Rodelli perhaps would have wanted to participate in himself, talking about how their the final Zodiac Killer crime was the murder of Paul Stein on October 11th of 1969. Now, number one, who committed the crime? Number two, how did this person escape? And number three, did the killer have scars on his neck? Because one thing that Thomas Warren is now talking about is that no one ever talks about the Zodiac Killer's scars on his neck. And I used to follow Thomas Warren's show rather closely, the Stones Unturned podcast, and one day he pulled up the Zodiac Killer composite sketch after the Stein murder, and he showed the scars on the killer's neck, and I think he just had an aha moment on the spot. The reason why I say this is, I don't know what it was about the sketch, whether it was the lighting or the angle, but I also zoned in on that, just like, oh my goodness, those marks on the killer's neck look so bold. And I should say, on the composite sketch, on the composite sketch of the killer, looked very bold, like they just stood out and more so than normal. And Thomas Horn says, well, why doesn't anyone ever talk about these scars on the killer's neck? And ultimately, I have to be on the side with Druzer saying that I don't believe that those are scars. I believe that those are details that were added by the artist simply just to fill space, show extra lines, also possibly to show age. Because this is the stuff that really needs... um to be hashed out in a, in a debate. When Thomas Warren states that there are multiple witness descriptions of um, the Zodiac Killer, some people estimate that the killer could be around 25 years old, 35 years old, and early to mid-40s, which would mean like 40 to 45. After the murder of Paul Stein, Officer Falcon Zelms, Officer Falcon Zelms, saw the Zodiac, and Officer Falcon made the estimation that the killer or the person walking down the street that he saw was five feet ten inches tall maybe 180 to 200 pounds and perhaps mid-30s to mid-40s but what thomas henry horn says is the killer was actually probably much younger based on the witness description from the robbins kids saying that he was around 25 to 30 or that that's the witness statement but as i understand from discussing this with richard grinnell that was not a witness description. That was the age attributed to the sketch. It was a forensic estimation based on how old they thought the killer was. And that's not done by any witness. That was just, it's an estimation based on looking at the composite sketch. I think that that's crazy, to be honest. When you look at a colorized composite sketch, very clearly, I think that um, the killer looks much older than that. But... I also um, just thought that it was, you know, a moment of contention within the debate. Now, the stuff that I find to be truly, truly powerful in a debate like this on Planet X Filmworks, again, it's called um, the Zodiac Killer Debate Files, and I invite you to go over there. Please subscribe to Planet X Filmworks. By the way, Ross is getting closer and closer to a 1,000 subscribers. So uh, if, if you um, want to follow along with Zodiac Killer episodes, I invite you to check out his channel. But... As far as the Zodiac's operations, another crime took place at Lake Berryessa, and Thomas Horan has talked about how he has had multiple suspects for the Lake Berryessa stabbing, and first he talked about how Dennis Land was the prime suspect in that one, in his mind. Dennis Land was the first park ranger to find the two victims who had been stabbed, Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard, and in this one, he has also talked about how 
that Leonard Lake, one of the Boneyard Killers, should be viewed as another suspect in the Lake Berryessa stabbing, and that Dennis Land was his accomplice. He has finally found a way to tie it together, because in the past he said Dennis Land, then he said Leonard Lake. This was really the first time that I've heard him say it was these two guys together, and that Leonard Lake was making a snuff film. Now, if you go back to my episode on the son of Zodiac, I say very clearly, well, how on earth would this snuff film be done? Without somebody noticing, without marks in the ground, if it was done on a boat in the water, how powerful was the camera, all of this. I think that that's somewhat of a far out and ridiculous theory, to be honest. Now, that, it's, that isn't even so much about either suspect. That's the idea of those two people working together, and then one of them either goes on to make the phone call that happens one hour and ten minutes after the crime took place, or they had another accomplice to do that. I mean, that's just so far out. I mean, like, it's just that all of those things happened. This goes into something that um, people really, really want to hammer down on the hoax theory with, and that is that he, Thomas Horne is just attributing the different roles in the hoax theory to different people. Well, a different person made the phone calls. Well, a different person wrote the ciphers. Well, a different person committed the Lake Berryessa stabbing. He's just attributing the different roles in the case to different people. Now, you want to talk challenge questions. Here's one that came from Thomas Horne when he asked Druser, what is the evidence that rules out a copycat at Lake Berryessa, that the Lake Berryessa stabbing was committed by the same person who did any other Zodiac crime. What is the evidence that the message on the car door at Lake Berryessa was written by the same person who wrote the other Zodiac letters? What is the evidence of that? And Druser more or less didn't have an answer for that. And I think that's not exactly fair. I mean, it's a debate, so he doesn't have an answer for that, so that's a point for Thomas Henry Horne. But one point he could have said was that Mark Hewitt responded to that exact question by saying, well, that's because it's an unsolved case. If this were a solved case, and we had the same fingerprints from one person found at all the crime scenes, and we knew who that person was, then that wouldn't be a mystery anymore. I mean, really, I think that the Zodiac killer was just lucky not to leave more evidence behind. I also think that the Zodiac had a little bit of awareness. I mean, even a fool would know that you're going to leave fingerprints behind. Someone with an elementary school education would know that you're going to leave fingerprints behind. So most of the time, the Zodiac was wearing gloves. So I think. So says me. But, I mean, who knows? As I said, it's an unsolved case. Now, it's not a satisfying answer. Well, I mean, if it... <laughs> What Mark Hewitt was trying to say was, if we had a bunch of evidence that all pointed toward one person, we would know who the killer was, and it would be a game over. But here is a challenge question that was brought up by Druzer, and that was that it relates to, to one of the letters that was written by the Zodiac Killer, a letter and a cipher. The Z13 cipher is followed by a section of text that says, I'm mildly serious to know how much you have on my head. And the word serious is spelled C-E-R-O-U-S. It's supposed to be curious, but it's spelled serious. And this is actually somewhat of a good point from Thomas Henry Horne when he says that that could be meaning a chemical compound like serous oxalate. Serous oxalate was used by forensic investigators. And the question was, what would be the motive for that? That was Druser's challenge question. Why would the Zodiac killer use a misspelling that resembles a chemical compound. Serious anything. It doesn't only have to be serious oxalate. And my attempt to answer that would be, it was just an influence on his thinking and word choice. I have always said, I believe the Zodiac Killer's misspellings were intentional. I don't think that they were some type of problem with spelling and language. I think that he misspelled words on purpose. And if he's someone who's familiar with the sciences, and a lot of people believe the Zodiac was, that would have been something that just influenced his word choice. I'm not trying to share any type of secret covert message, no, but instead that this is just somebody who was, wasn't even, might not even been paying that much attention, but if somebody who works with chemicals, someone who works with chemistry, someone who even had a lot of chemistry education in college would write that. It influenced his word choice. And Robert Graysmith, of all people, wants to remind us that 
Arthur Lee Allen even had a high understanding of chemistry. So, I mean, lots of Zodiac suspects have connections to um, the math and science world, and it doesn't only have to be chemistry. For example, Drew Beeson talks about um, Donald Lee Cheney as a Zodiac suspect, and Don Cheney was an engineer, graduated from Cal Poly Pomona, and he was a pipe stress analyst, something along that lines. I mean, Gareth Penn accused Michael O'Hare of being the Zodiac killer. He is... I mean, Michael O'Hare worked in architecture and public policy, but also had a math background, someone who had a very high understanding of mathematics. Math, sciences, engineering, all of that stuff comes into play. But we have to bear in mind that the Zodiac Killer could have learned about those things from the military, from being a pilot or a sailor. Maybe he was both working in something like the Navy Air Corps, Army Air Corps, something to that effect. So... There um, are possibilities on how the Zodiac's language could be influenced, but I think that that's a strong point for Thomas Horne in the debate as well. But one thing that I did not hear discussed was the Blue Rock Springs shooting, because somebody's writing letters taking credit for crimes that they didn't commit. Well, how? How on earth would they have done that? And Thomas Horne says that at first somebody was listening to a police scanner Darlene Farron is murdered on July 4th of 1969. The police are putting out just some basic info over the radio. Somebody hears that. Then they go and make a prank call saying, If you go one mile east on the Columbus Parkway, you'll find two kids that were shot with a 9mm Luger. I'm the one who did that. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. That thing. That thing that I'm sure you've heard of once or twice. And that could have just been a prank caller no specific information. This wasn't even brought up in the debate about how he says, I also killed those kids last year. Well, who's who's saying anything about where and when and how and the names of the victims, what location? None of that is mentioned in the phone call. It's sometime between July 5th of 1969 and July 31st, somebody decides that they're going to connect the Lake Herman Road murders to the Blue Rock Springs shooting and then they write a letter that's uh, written three times, actually, and three parts of a cipher are mailed to the, the newspapers, the Vallejo Times-Herald, San Francisco Chronicle, and the San Francisco Examiner. Okay, so how did they get the information to put in those letters? Because the killer is saying, I shall state some facts that only I and the police know, so, so he can prove that he took credit for it. Well, Thomas Henry Horn says this was a member of law enforcement named Harold K. Snook, who had access to the police reports, and he read the police reports and learned the information. This is the stuff that wasn't mentioned in the debate. Firstly, this is still one of Thomas Horne's best finds, that Darlene Farron was murdered wearing a slack dress, but somebody saw that in the paper, slack dress, and maybe it was a man who, by the paper, I mean in the paper of the, the police report, like on the paper report, like they're reading the paper report, and they saw slack dress, and they didn't know what a slack dress was, so then they just assumed that it was dress slacks, which more people would be familiar with, and they said the girl was wearing patterned slacks, but she was indeed wearing a slack dress, and a slack dress is a one-piece jumpsuit that does have leggings, or like it has um pant legs on it, but I mean, Darlene Farron would have been sitting down at the time. I still think that that is a highly credible observation from Thomas Horan, but I thought Druser was going to say something that he has shared in the past, and that is that if these crimes are a hoax, why wouldn't the killer just say that Mike Majot was shot in the lower leg, like it says in the police reports, when it says in the Zodiac's letter that the boy was shot in the knee? And the Zodiac would say this again when he makes a, his debut letter, giving himself the name, that um, the boy was, you know, like doing something, flailing around, he, he goes in the back seat, thus spoiling my aim, that's why I shot him in the knee. The Zodiac says it multiple times that he shot Mike Michaud in the knee, when in the police report it says he was shot in the lower leg. I mean, that's another strong piece of um, ammunition that I didn't hear used in the debate. But what do you guys think? Do you think that there was a single Zodiac killer, or do you think it was all a hoax? Maybe made up by the San Francisco Chronicle, maybe made up by some type of spy network. What do you think about all of this? Please put your ideas in the comments section down below. Now, I would like to go over to the documentary Deciphering the Zodiac Killer, which is on Jason Hassett's channel, moving to our next segment here on Zodiac Monday. And this is a documentary 
that is relying heavily on three sources. One of them is the documentary This is the Zodiac Speaking. One of them is His Name Was Arthur Lee Allen. They are the companion documentaries to the 2007 Fincher film. And the third one is the Myth of the Zodiac Killer documentary, which came out on Peacock. Thomas Horan is going to be getting a lot of time here on Zodiac Monday. And Jason Hassett shared a lot of commentary that was from other people. And it's really not only till about halfway into the documentary that he starts sharing his own ideas about the case. I mean, that was my response to everything. But even though you're hearing all of these different things, like from different documentaries, you're even hearing some of Jason's own responses, I thought that the best part were when he showed clips of Robert Graysmith talking about the case. And it goes so far beyond the Great Zodiac Killer hoax of 1986. It goes to the fact that we know that Robert Graysmith didn't always tell the truth. For example, he shares a clip from Robert Graysmith on a talk show and Graysmith is giving an opinionated statement. It's not even an untrue statement. It's an opinionated statement. When someone asks him the question, why was the Zodiac Killer never captured? And Graysmith's response is that the Zodiac was very intelligent. He had education and knowledge of a lot of different systems. He knew about cryptography. He knew about bomb making. I mean, he was someone who was familiar with a lot of different methods of criminal behavior. And he also disguised a lot of things. While the Zodiac was definitely deceptive, he... I mean, can I just be honest with you? The reason why the Zodiac Killer didn't get captured was because Don Falcon and Eric Selms were looking for a black man and not a white man, and this Caucasian male walked right by them. The Zodiac Killer got lucky. Not only that, even if you dispute that the way that they talked about in the um, debate with Horn and Druzer, well, how about at the Blue Rock Springs shooting when Officer Richard Hoffman is patrolling the park prior to the arrival of the Zodiac, and the Zodiac also just missed the police. The Zodiac got lucky, unless you entertain some wild theory that the police were behind the whole thing and the police were involved with all of it, but I don't personally subscribe to that. Or in more honest terms, I think that there is insufficient evidence to support a theory like that. So the Zodiac is, I mean, he's not stupid. Let's be clear, the Zodiac had some intelligence. He used it for a destructive purpose, but he was intelligent. Now, was he extremely intelligent, extremely gifted? I haven't really seen a lot of evidence of that. The Zodiac was educated in bomb making and explosives. That's another point that was shared by Robert Graysmith. Okay, well, did the Zodiac ever detonate a bomb that was successful? I haven't seen any evidence of that. I see the Zodiac crying in a letter saying, well, my bus bomb was a dud because I was swamped out by the rain we had a while back. Oops, the whoopsie daisy. Something like that. I really haven't seen anything that would show that the Zodiac had any real knowledge of bomb making. And yes, the Zodiac drew out bomb diagrams, but anybody who had exposure to some type of textbook or diagram or any other place could have, that could have been copied or obtained, or even if somebody told them about that. I mean, some people have written into this channel saying they have electronics backgrounds and engineering backgrounds, and they think that the Zodiac's bomb diagrams were actually somewhat credible. They could have copied it from somewhere. And the fact of the matter is the Zodiac did not detonate a successful bomb, to the best of my knowledge and to the best of most people, the best of the knowledge of most people who follow the case. There's also a very particular quote that was shared in Jason Hassett's documentary. Um, it's actually from The Most Dangerous Game. It's from the movie version of The Most Dangerous Game. When this is the story of when people are being hunted for sport, and the villain in that one says that it's like playing outdoor chess. Michael Butterfield of ZodiacKillerFacts.com once made a documentary about Robert Graysmith when he was showing various pieces of Graysmith in other interviews when he said the Zodiac frequently referred to his crimes as a game of outdoor chess. And Butterfield's response was, the Zodiac has never once referred to his crimes as a game of outdoor chess. In all of the letters and all of the things that I've read about the Zodiac Killer, I have never once heard the Zodiac or seen, read, or obtained any information that the Zodiac referred to his crimes as a game of outdoor chess. And I think that that is just also something that Graysmith is fudging the facts on again. Graysmith made up a bunch of stuff. Maybe we can all agree upon that. Some people still like 
the 86 Zodiac book. Some people still like Zodiac Unmasked. Some people still like the Fincher film. Sure, enjoy it. I'm not telling you not to. But I do agree with the statements that Gray Smith fudged the facts in an enormous amount of areas. And Drew Beeson likes to use the term Gray Smithing, putting two ideas together that don't belong or saying things that are half true and half false. And I do need to say one point in regards to the debate that was um, mentioned. And this is definitely relevant to Jason Hassett's documentary as well, because it's talking about who wrote the letters and who wrote the ciphers. Thomas Horan points out that very, very clearly in the ciphers, there is different handwriting. And who is like the ciphers are neat and the um, the letters are all messy. Drew Beeson points out that someone could have used a light table or some type of tracing mechanism to write very neat ciphers. So even if there's different handwriting on the ciphers, it doesn't mean they were written by different people. Drew Beeson is the author of Sighting In on the Zodiac Killer. But back to Jason Hassett's documentary, he brings up Thomas Horne's suspect for the Lake Berryessa stabbing, Dennis Land, who was discussed in the, um, in the Myth of the Zodiac Killer documentary, meaning that Thomas Horne doesn't explore the possibility of Leonard Lake in that one. And what Jason said in this film was that Dennis Land mostly gets ruled out as a suspect for him because a phone call came in at the, at, um, oh, let's see, that would have been 7.40 p.m. on September 27th of 1969, and Dennis Land was not anywhere near the payphone used. He was at Lake Berryessa, and that is um, something that I think that you'll never, you're never going to debunk the hoax theory because you can always say, what? It was another active participant who made the call. Dennis Land is discussed in the uh, documentary Deciphering the Zodiac Killer, Deciphering the Zodiac Killer for a different reason, though, and that is, Dennis Land destroyed the Lake Berryessa crime scene. Why would he do that? Why would somebody who has been through training on how to handle a crime scene destroy it? And, like, I've heard a couple different variants of the story. One of them is that Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard were on a picnic blanket, and then the Zodiac Killer comes by, and he attacks them. And that in one variant of the story, Dennis Land took the blanket and he wanted to wrap it around Cecilia Shepard when he found her. And in the um, documentary clips that they shared in Deciphering the Zodiac Killer, the statement was that Dennis Land wanted to do that. To, he folded it up because he wanted it to be preserved for evidence, which would have been completely against all of his training, all of, because Dennis Land even studied criminal justice at Napa Valley Junior College, not only being a park ranger and so on, he should have known better than to do that. Now, does this point toward him having some type of involvement in the Zodiac Killer mystery? I'm going to share something with you guys, and this is going to be a very twisted, long-winded explanation, but I promise it will come back to the point. And that is that, in 2019, I did an episode on Black Box Online Radio about the death of Lisa Buchanan. It's called The Doctor's Sex Tape, Chris Coolis and Lisa Buchanan. And his name is spelled like Christ, but it's pronounced Chris. And this was the story of a doctor who made a sex tape with a woman, and she died shortly after. On the tape, she was very, very high on drugs at an unhealthy level, and that ultimately led to her passing away. Now... The question was, should the doctor be found guilty of murder because he knew that she was in an unhealthy state and he didn't get medical assistance or offer it himself? And then, it was, was it possible that the doctor injected her with the drugs which he had at the time? And all of these questions, it was mentioned on one of the crime shows several years ago. And it's actually one of the more popular black box online radio recordings because, um, well, it's called The Doctor's Sex Tape. It was actually picked up by a porn site. I kid thee not, I'm not even joking. And I really think people would have been disappointed when they're trying to watch porn, and then all of a sudden you hear BBO or Black Box Online Radio. Maybe if they're, maybe they'd listen anyway, hopefully. And it's no longer up there now, so you don't even have to search around, but that did happen. But it starts out that this doctor is with a woman who's very high on drugs. Then he finds her unconscious, and he slaps her. And I was watching this episode on a true crime show with a family member who is a doctor and said, no, no, absolutely not. A doctor should never do that. That's completely against medical procedure. It's completely against any training that a doctor would have had. And then you see Chris Coolis talking in, in the episode saying, I know it's completely against training. It's just 
I know I'm trained not to do stuff like that. I just, she was unconscious, so I slapped her. And my family member, who was a doctor, was saying that he's probably making up a story. It's probably there was a bruise on her face, and he's trying to provide an explanation as to how it got there. And I had a different response. And this is how this actually connects to Dennis Land. Why would he destroy the crime scene at Lake Berryessa by moving the blanket? Chris Coolis or Dennis Land? I think that there was just something unexpected that happened that was a very strong moment of intensity, something that was not planned or predicted, and this person reacted because they are only human. I know they have training that says otherwise. They are only human, and they responded to something just on instinct, not according to the training manual. I think these types of events happen all the time. That's why I shared the story of Chris Coolis and Lisa Buchanan. I just don't think that there's anything else other than that. Now, those are interpretations of the evidence. Now, if you want to look at Thomas Horan in the Myth of the Zodiac Killer documentary, also this was shared in Jason Hassett's documentary. As I said, he uses multiple segments from it. It's called Deciphering the Zodiac Killer. They show Horan providing the explanation that he suspects that Dennis Land was involved with the Lake Berryessa stabbing because, number one, as a park ranger, he would have had access to the ranger-only roads, which were authorized entry only. And also, he was out of radio contact at the time of the crime. And they've gone through the logs. They show that that was indeed true. Should he be suspicious? I mean, those are the things I find much more valuable than looking at him destroying the crime scene, unless he actually did it. Oh, well, I mean, I mean, if he actually committed the Lake Berryessa stabbing, sure, sure, that's what he was doing. Absolutely, he's destroying evidence, but no proof of that whatsoever. So I had to provide a more skeptical interpretation of the evidence. What do you think about Dennis Land as a Zodiac Killer suspect? What do you think about him as a suspect in the Lake Berryessa stabbing? What do you think about Robert Graysmith? And if you would like to watch the documentary in its entirety, it's called Deciphering the Zodiac Killer on Jason Hassett's YouTube channel. And I said that I had a challenge question from Mike Rodelli, who's the author of In the Shadow of Mount Diablo. And on the Friday episode, Mike Rodelli was my guest. And I was frequently saying In the Shadow of Mount Diablo and the Hunt for Zodiac. And he said, that's not the subtitle of his book. I'm aware that there are two different books. I often introduce it that way, but The Hunt for Zodiac was his e-book, and In the Shadow of Mount Diablo was available in paperback version. But he says you only need to read one or the other. But the subtitle of The Hunt for Zodiac is The Inconceivable Double Life of, oh crap, I already forgot, America's Most Notorious Murderer, or something like that. But his Zodiac Killer suspect is Shel Cavalli. And Shel Cavalli was a Norwegian-American businessman who was born in Trondheim, Norway, in 1919. He came to the United States at the age of 10 in 1929. And somebody once brought this to my attention, about how there are photos online that are mislabeled as Shel Cavalli that are actually his brother Newt, K-N-U-T-E. And... What someone said was, I think Newt Cavale actually has a better resemblance to the Zodiac Killer composite sketch than Shell Cavale, Mike Rodelli's suspect. So I just, you know, I brought that up to Mike Rodelli, and he said, well, someone needs to provide a circumstantial case for Newt Cavale being the Zodiac Killer. He's done one for Shell Cavale. Look at the one. Let's, let's make one for his brother. So that's what I'm going to try to do right now. And I said some of this on the Friday show, but Mike Rodelli's theory is heavily connected to synchronicity, talking about how Shel Cavale's mother died on December 20th, and the Zodiac Killer committed a crime on December 20th of 1968. Shel Cavale's father was born on September 27th of 19... So his father was born on September 27th. Mike Rodelli fumbled with this as well. The Zodiac Killer committed a crime on September 27th of 1969. Shel Cavale's father was actually born in the 1800s, but that's a date that those dates would also be relevant to his brother, Canute. As, sorry, Newt. That's someone informed me. That's how it's pronounced. And this shows us that all of these things could be pointing to his brother. And the micro was first tipped off about Shel Cavalli because he wanted to know, did the Zodiac killer write letters to the editor, letters to a newspaper under his real name? So he began investigating. He landed on Shel Cavalli. But how about 
his brother knew that his older brother was writing letters to the newspaper, and he decided to copy that he because it, the letter would have come roughly six months after the Lake Herman Road murders, and somebody like Newt would have had the idea to to um connect this to a set of homicides that maybe he was planning and also also if he were if he were the zodiac newt allegedly lived in los angeles at the time according to mike rodelli's research but uh dr michael suddeth i believe he's the one who came up with this that showed that you the zodiac killer would have only needed to go into the bay area six times to mail all of the zodiac letters that have been definitively attributed to him Again, someone who isn't living in the Bay Area is committing these crimes, and then what is he, where is he going to go? His brother's house, and his brother lived in Presidio Heights, where Paul Stein was murdered. And it's just about how somebody is always going to have an explanation about how I don't live there. Well, uh, where were you on October 11th of 1969? I don't remember what I had for breakfast. And Shell Cavalli and Newt Cavalli actually have very similar life stories. I'm going to go over to Legacy.com and read his obituary. Newt Cavalli was born on November 17th of 1922, and he died on March 11th of 2010. And Newt would have been 46 at the time, so not only does he match the Presidio Heights composite sketch a little bit more with the hairline, but also he would have been younger. So some people would think that Shell Cavalli was too old being 50 years old, while his brother would have been in his mid-40s, so that's a little bit closer to some of the other witness descriptions. So, Shulk, so Newt Cavale is born in Norway. He first saw his adopted country at the age of seven when he was on a ship of Captain Bjarna Cavale, who was his father and his mother Signa, who immigrated to Seattle with their five children. Cavale attended Seattle's Jefferson Elementary and James Madison Junior High and graduated in 1940 from West Seattle High School, where he met his lifelong love, Gloria Alford. They married in 1941. Cavalli attended the University of Washington and served in the South Pacific in World War II with the Army Air Corps. Okay, so Newt Cavalli is in the Army Air Corps. Shell Cavalli was a naval pilot. As I said, very similar life stories. I know that they're brothers, but there's more things. He returned to Seattle to work in the shipping supply company with his father, the company which his father founded, and later Newt Cavalli bought the firm. He and Gloria attended the Fauntleroy Congressional Church, and he supported the YMCA camp on Orcas Island where he set the record for a grueling swim, row, and run event in his teens. All right, Shell Cavalli, his brother, actually tied the unofficial world record for the 100-meter dash, and Newt Cavalli also seems like he is very much into sports, swimming, rowing, and running, also a record-breaker. Brothers might have been uh, competing for each other. In 1954, when he was 32, he moved to Portland. The opportunity came for him to import the Volkswagen Beetle. His brother also worked in car imports. His distributorship grew to 83 dealers in five states, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho, and led to Porsche and Audi distributions. Having learned to ski about the time he learned to walk, <laughs> I love that sentence, he remained an avid athlete and fitness enthusiast in all of his life. In sports business or academics, he shared his expertise like a natural teacher and gave time and treasure anonymously to many organizations. Newt Cavalli, the meticulously dressed man with the, with the beaming smile, was welcomed to everyone. Survivors include his wife, Gloria, daughter, Karen, granddaughter, Christina, and grandchildren, Newt and Hannah. Yes, his same name. Uh, the grandkid was named after him. And siblings, Shell Cavalli of San Francisco, Bjarna Cavalli of Rancho Mirage, uh, maybe it's Mirage in California. A memorial service will be held at 11 a.m. Okay, it goes on for a while, but as you see, Shell Cavalli was more or less an auto executive. Newt Cavalli even went into a similar field. Both of them have some similar life stories, but what? Newt is younger, and he matches the witness descriptions more, and you have explanations for the synchronicity of his mother's death date, his father's birth date, leading up to the crime scenes. Now, one point that Mike Rodelli does have is that July 5th of 1969, the date that Darlene Farron was murdered, actually showed um, I showed a connection to uh, Shel Cavalli's UFO incident when he allegedly saw a flying saucer. I confess that's something that would be a stronger point for Shell's involvement in the case. But I have to give a shout-out to Anthony R.R. R. Mills, who is firstly the one who provided me with the pronunciation of Newt's name, saying it's not Canute, it's Newt. That's how he was known to people. And 
Another piece of evidence in favor of the Cavales having anything to do with the Zodiac crimes is that they were from Trondheim, Norway, and Trondheim, Norway is the sister city of Vallejo, and just maybe some way, somehow that that's a clue. Anthony R. R. Mills wrote in saying, Hi Ned, another interesting show as always. However, I do not think that Shell Cavale really seems like a viable suspect for the Zodiac on so many different levels. First, just because a successful business person has been accomplished and has a lot of drive, to do more, it does not follow logically that he has two options, either to become a serial killer or go into politics. That was a claim Mike Rodelli made in my most recent interview. What you will see, what, what you see are successful business persons, usually businessmen, is that they don't retire, even though they could, because they have enough money and are accomplished, what most people believe to be quote-unquote enough, they rather keep working their entire lives or they will often drop dead of a heart attack, simply because their drive to continue is business and make even more money. Of course, there are plenty of wealthy people who have killed other people. While I'm not an expert in true crime, I have seen over the years that a businessman kills somebody else because it's the guy who's sleeping with his wife, or kills his cheating wife, or he kills a business partner who's become problematic. Oh, I've seen countless examples of that on forensic files. I often call it the forensic files murder where... Somebody commits a murder for life insurance, and sometimes, sometimes, well, firstly, I called it the Forensic Files murder because every other case on Forensic Files that I happened to be exploring at the time was somebody killing somebody for life insurance, but sometimes you will see a business person murdering their partner so they can take control of the business. I mean, absolutely, things like that do happen now. Were the Cavales doing stuff like that? According to Mike Rodelli, absolutely not. Instead, they were committing the Zodiac crimes, which were not business people, but uh, much younger people. However, so I think what Anthony is trying to say is that is something in profiling that would match up with um, a different type of killer. Second, from the discussion by your guest, Mike Rodelli, the Presidio neighborhood is presented as an obscure, out-of-the-way area of San Francisco that nobody but a resident of the neighborhood would know about. I know fairly little about San Francisco other than what you get in the general media, and I also do think that it has an interesting history, but I think anybody who is from outside of California knows anything about San Francisco neighborhoods. The one that they probably heard of would be Presidio Heights, and then perhaps the Tenderloin then the Castro District and Knob Hill. While crimes are often committed to close to where people live, and that is not always the case. I mean, I think it's... While crimes are often committed near to where most people live, that's not always the case. I think that's the sentence. I don't know if the crimes are usually committed in the person's neighborhood. This might rule out Cavale. Thirdly, as far as coincidences of dates and times go, this is the stuff I really wanted to read out to you guys. Vallejo is a sister city of Trondheim. I am very leery of such coincidences. I would like to see actual evidence of other serial killers who choose specific dates to commit their crimes based on calendar events and milestones related to their lives. And because everybody has a birth date and deceased people, all have a particular date that they died on, and all married people have wedding anniversaries, and all people have parents and often siblings and sometimes children, you can find a milestone date that fits all types of unconnected events. Birthdays, wedding anniversaries, dates of death, Saying that a Zodiac murder took place ten years after Cavalli had participated in an organized car race does not seem very strong event. Well, um, uh, okay, okay, that's a, I don't want to provide a giant explanation for that one, so we'll, we'll just move on. Was Vallejo picked because of Trondheim? I checked on Wikipedia to see if Trondheim and Vallejo were sister cities, and sure enough, they were. I've never doubted that. I mean, I've actually looked that up too, yes. But looking at Trondheim's list of sister cities, I also see that one of them was Split, Croatia. Split, Croatia is a sister city. And guess what? My grandmother was born in Split, Croatia. And sometimes, perhaps around the time of the First World War, she was sent away and ended up in the Philippines. And then in the 1920s, she ended up in Seattle. But that's not where it ends. My mother worked for a man who had been in the automotive industry in Portland, Oregon. And one of his business associates of some type was an individual named Newt Cavale, Shell's brother. By the way, we always pronounce his name as Newt, not Canute. Yeah, he's the one who shared that. Anthony, thank you so much. I just bring up all these connections simply to show that sometimes connections are an actual chain of circumstantial clues, and other times they are just random facts that coincidentally exist, but do not actually form the pieces of a puzzle into an actual solution. Fourthly, the impression that I have of Shel Cavale from what I've read from Zodiac-related websites is that he liked speed. Perhaps he was an adrenaline junkie. When you look at the four canonical Zodiac crimes, these don't seem to be crimes committed by 
wealthy adrenaline junkie. I don't see the, this person cruising around lover's lanes and killing teenagers. I don't see an automotive entrepreneur hanging around Lake Berryessa, hopping behind trees to put on an executioner's hood and lumbering down to stab two people and not even successfully killing all of the intended victims. Such attacks may fulfill an urge by a psychopath, but I'm not convinced that it rises to the level of what somebody like Shel Cavalli would call a thrill kill. I think that that is enough for now, but I do appreciate all your effort, and I do support you interviewing the guests that you have, even if I may disagree with them. Thanks again, Anthony. I just had to throw that in there because so many things that Thomas Warren has talked about, I've touched upon that thing as well about well, the military base angle is a little bit different. That just means that somebody was in the military, and that's more of an explanation rather than a coincidence. But Anthony is really zoned in on these um, coincidences that people find, the world of synchronicity, if you will. And what would you like to share about any of the suspects, the Cavale brothers, Dennis Land, um, some of the other people that have been loosely mentioned, Arthur Lee Allen and Don Chaney, the Zodiac hoax theory, and um, once again, you can watch the debate on Planet X Filmworks. You can also watch Deciphering the Zodiac Killer on Jason Hassett's channel, and listen to my interview with Mike Rodelli here on Black Box Online Radio. And I would like to end with your supporter shout-outs. Anybody who makes a donation or contribution to help support the show will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. And our first one comes to us from River Prawn Pottery. Our second one comes to us from Batman66. Batman bought you a coffee on buymeacoffee.com. I never get tired of saying that. Batman bought you a coffee. And thirdly, of course, Stuart McAdam, who is the sponsor of today's episode. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Anybody who can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxnid88 on Instagram. And please tune in Friday for my interview with Ray Grant. And that's all for me now. Goodbye.